You know, I've always said, if you guys are going to applaud, at least do it heartily. That's really pathetic. Oh, my gosh. It's all, it's, they, they do that at church. Yeah, there you go. All right. They do that at church, too. You ever notice that? You know, it's like the end of, end of a sermon. They go, ah. You know, I feel terrible. So, uh, I, I really am appreciative to the Alliance Defense Fund for uh, allowing us to have this place. And so it really is a, a huge blessing. You know, I, one of the things I said starting in 2008 through the whole recession that uh, I know it technically hasn't continued on, but it sure feels like it, is that God is a God of provision. And that actually threw some people when you'd say that, because I don't think many Christians really thought about that. But the reality is, is that he said, not a sparrow falls to the ground outside of his will. Every hair on your head is numbered, and that God provides for his own. We don't know what always that means, right? And many of us try to demand that God provide this way for us, and God says, no, I'm going to provide this way for you. But the reality is, is that he does provide uh, for his people. And so, you know, when Dave and I were talking over the summer about where we were going to be, I just had full confidence, and, and so did Dave and many of you, that the Lord would provide for us, and he's used Alliance Defense Fund to do that. Uh, make sure you have a packet today. If you don't, uh, they're up here, and uh, Bob just might be generous enough to get you one. And, uh, and, but make sure you get a packet, and, and ideally, if you could bring it back, that's the most helpful, because we put all six lessons in here for you. I'll explain that in just a minute here. Um, I got to tell you, it's a perfect setting being here at ADF for what we're going to do over the next two months here at Marketplace Bible Study. The reason it's a perfect setting is because we're actually going to talk about the defense of the faith. We're going to talk about how uh, you and I as believers can have confidence in the faith that we have in Christ and our Christianity, as well as how to uh, share with others the reasons that we believe. And you say, well, what's ADF have to do with that? Well, ADF is an organization that protects the rights of believers in the states and throughout the world uh, to, and the rights of churches to be able to talk freely and honestly and candidly about our faith. And so I see this as a great marriage for what we're going to be doing in Marketplace over the next uh, two months here. Uh, I want to tell you the origin of the study that we're going to be doing because it's kind of personal to me. Uh, this study actually was put together uh, 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, I was pastoring in Canada, uh, in London, Ontario. It was my first senior pastor post, so I was on my own. And Canada at that time had about 4% of the people went to church. They estimated about 2% would have been evangelical believers. So an incredibly, uh, just, I mean, beat up spiritually uh, country. And I, you felt it. You, you felt it all over the place. You felt it talking with people. I mean, it was the first time, because I didn't experience this in my hometown in the, in the States, it was the first time I'd ever really talked to somebody that grew up in Western culture and had absolutely no clue at all about Jesus. I mean, none at all. I mean, you, you know, I know there's a lot of unchurched people today, but they know the story of the prodigal son. They know the story of the good Samaritan. They know there's this thing called the Bible, and they know there's this person named Jesus. Uh, but in Canada, I mean, there was an entire generation of people that knew nothing, I mean, literally nothing about Christianity. And so it was an incredible mission field, but also uh, you had to think very creatively about how, how are you going to reach people. And just before I was leaving there, I was only there for two and a half years, uh, I did a series, uh, an outreach series for my community called What Keeps Me From Believing. What Keeps Me From Believing. And, and it was just the lessons that we're going to look at today that were initially geared toward reaching lost people. But here's what's happened to me over the last decade. It's over the last decade what's hit me is that those same things, not, not dial into this, those same things that keep them from believing are the same things that keep me believing. Isn't that interesting? The same accusations that I've gotten over the years from people like my father or other seekers that I might interact with that, 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 that in which they say, well, well, you believe that, but that keeps me from believing, I turn around and say, well, that's exactly the thing that keeps me believing. So as we're going to see today, they say the Bible is a myth. And so, you know, how can you believe a book that was written, you know, thousands of years ago by many different authors, obviously on par with Homer's Odyssey or something like that? Uh, and I say, well, actually, no, it's not a myth. And when I show you the confidence that we have in the Bible, not only should that start kickstart your belief, but it keeps me believing. And, and, and same with all the other topics, things like science versus evolution, uh, the problem of evil, Christianity being, quote, narrow-minded, the uh, whole issue of hell, uh, 
meaning. And so that's what I want to do over the next uh, two months here at Marketplace, is we're going to take a look at the things that would keep others from believing, but they're things that I think keep you and I believing in Christ. And the first objection, or the first issue we're going to look at, is uh, the Bible. And the fact of, is the Bible a myth, or is it not a myth? Now, let me explain the history of that and, uh, and, and, and why that is such a critical issue today. Interestingly, if you lived 150 years ago in Western culture, meaning here in the States or in Western Europe or anywhere like that, um, the reality is, is that you would have been in what we call Christendom, and by and large, 150, 200 years ago, there would not have been hardly any attacks on the Bible as a source of truth about God. But coming out of the Enlightenment about 150 years ago, culture started to change. It was called the Age of Reason. And as we just talked the last couple weeks about Revelation, during the Age of Reason, reason got elevated more than Revelation. For the first 1,850 years of Christianity, through Augustine and Aquinas and the Reformation, Revelation was always above reason. So if God said it, you needed to reasonably understand it, but revelation had its rightful place, and reason did too. And during the Enlightenment, we flip-flopped that. And so about 150 years ago, Western culture, especially America and Europe, started to come out with some significant attacks on the Bible. And these attacks didn't just happen from outside of Christianity, but remember when Paul the Apostle said in Acts 20, beware, there will be savage wolves that come from within the church? It happened within the church. And, and, and in Germany especially, uh, it became known as German form criticism. Theologians actually started to attack the truthfulness of the Bible, and they started to state things like this. Well, it obviously wasn't written in the first century. It must have been written in the second century. And there was such a long intervening time between the time that the apostles and Jesus lived till they actually wrote the New Testament that they probably forgot a lot of things or a lot of embellishments came in. And so a lot of what has been handed down today isn't really true. It, it contains a lot of hyperbole, a lot of myth, a lot of legend, and so we really don't know what happened with Jesus. And, and that's really the argument that a lot of people started to make, that we can't have confidence that this book is historically reliable, and if it's not historically reliable, then certainly it can't be God's word, because God doesn't use myth to communicate to us. And that was basically the argument. And so the two issues that I want us to deal with today as we deal with the issue of whether the Bible is myth or not are historical reliability and then the whole issue of if it's historically reliable, how can we have confidence that it's God's word? Those are the two issues that you and I have to deal with. In fact, I would submit to you that those are the two issues that all of this hang on. If somebody wanted to prove to me as a Christian and as a theologian, that this book is not God's revelation to us, all they would have to do is show me that it's not historically reliable, that it contains uh, factual inaccuracies, inaccuracies, it contains mythical elements, or they would have to show me as a corollary that it's not inspired by God, that it's not his word. And though those two issues are, this, are uh, distinct, they also build one upon the other. So if you want to pull out your outline, let's first deal with the whole idea of the Bible as an historically reliable document. And I'm here today to try to blow away many of the myths that have been circulating for the last 150 years and are still alive at some prestigious seminaries out east and in many liberal churches today and on CNN and PBS specials and all the other stuff that we watch. Now, for the longest time, uh, there was a threefold test for determining the historical reliability of ancient documents. It's a threefold test that's applied not just to the Bible, but it was applied to Aristotle, Socrates, Abraham Lincoln. I mean, anything in, in history, especially of antiquity, there was a threefold test. And that threefold test I put up there for you are the manuscript origin evidence. We'll get to that in a second. And then internal evidence and then external evidence. Uh, manuscript origin evidence, internal evidence, and then external evidence. So how do we, what do we know about the origin of the manuscripts that we have? That will tell us if they're historically reliable or not. What internal evidence do we have within the documents of things like you'll see in a minute here, consistency and things like that? And then what kind of external evidence? Are there, is there any other outside writers that corroborate the things that are said in this document? And if a document can pass those three tests, 
then historically, again, whether it's secular data or biblical data, it is seen as an historically reliable document. So let's first consider manuscript origin evidence. Now, uh, we have three lines of evidence when it comes to manuscript origin evidence, and that is the age of the copies, and then what we might call, let me find my notes here, the number of copies, and then the agreement among the copies. Now, one of these guys you need to first understand, and this shocks some people because they don't know a lot about the Bible, but they don't know a lot about any documents from antiquity, is that we don't have any of the original documents from the New Testament. Do we all understand that? We don't have the original book of Galatians. We don't have the original gospel of Mark. Those did not survive when they were written, as I'm going to argue, in the first century. All we have is copies of copies. And though that shocks people initially because they say, how can you have confidence in that? What you need to understand is that all of uh, documents from antiquity are that way. As you'll see in a second here, we have no copies uh, or the original documents of Homer's Iliad, Aristotle's Poetics, uh, Tacitus's History of the Roman Empire, uh, Caesar's Gaelic Wars. Well, we don't have copies of any of that stuff. Uh, we just have, we don't have the originals of any of that stuff. We have copies that have been handed down. And so the way that you test whether a copy is historically reliable or not is through three ways. The age of the copies, and then the agreement among copies, and then the number of copies. So let's match the Bible up into that. Now, when you consider the age of the copies that we have, some of the earliest fragments we have of the New Testament actually date back to the beginning of the second century, written 30 to 60 years from the time of the original. That's pretty strong. Uh, the John Ryland Manuscript uh, dates back to about 130 A.D. It contains five verses from John chapter 18, and we know that John wrote his gospel sometime around 90 A.D. So we have fragments from the Gospel of John, an early copy of the Gospel of John, dating back to just within 40 years of when it was written. But we have the Chester Beatty Biblical Papyri. Uh, this was discovered in 1930. It now sits in a museum in Britain. It contains over 100 fragments, uh, largely from the four Gospels, also from Acts, and they date back to about 200 A.D. or early 3rd century. And, and so all of a sudden now you have maybe a spread of maybe 150 years that we have fragments from. And then we have tons of other fragments that date about 300 years from the time of the writing of the Bible. I mean, a lot of those fragments. Now, when I explain that to people, they say, 40 years, 150 years, 300 years, that, that like, seems like a really long interval. And in one sense it is, but, but let's get our heads and hearts around the whole idea of documents from antiquity. Okay, so for instance, uh, Homer's Iliad, which everybody accepts was from Homer, and they accept that Homer wrote it, was written in 800 B.C. The earliest copy we have dates to 300 A.D. So it was written 1,100 years after Homer wrote it. Aristotle's Poetics, which again, everybody accepts from Aristotle, was written in 350 B.C. The earliest copy we have is 1100 A.D., which means that it's 1450 years interval. Uh, Tacitus, who was a Roman historian in his Annals of Imperial Rome, wrote it in 116 A.D. The earliest copy we have is 850 A.D., a 700-year spread. Caesar's Gaelic Wars, a 900-year spread. Are you starting to see? Most documents from antiquity have a huge spread in them. We're talking you know, almost a thousand years. With the Bible, the vast majority of our copies were written within a few hundred years of it, and we have fragments that go all the way back to 40 years. I mean, it just blows away the competition, if you will, when you compare it to other documents of antiquity. And so Sir Frederick Kenyon, who is the director and principal librarian at the British Museum for years, once said it this way. Listen to this. He says, the interval then between the dates of original composition and the earliest extant evidence becomes so small with the New Testament as to be in fact negligible. And the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were originally written. And so the reality is when, when most honest historians look at the New Testament, just looking at manuscript evidence, just looking at the, when the copies were actually written, that they say there's a lot, a lot of confidence that the Bible that was originally written is the Bible that we have now. 
And then how many of you have ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Raise your hand if you have. I'll tell you why you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Usually when, a, uh, when, when, when some manuscripts are found, it's really not that big of a deal. I mean, we have so many of them. As you can hear in a minute, we have 23,000 Greek, Latin, and other translations just dating within to a few hundred years of the Bible. So we have so many copies of the Bible from very early on. But one of the problems we've had with the Old Testament is that for years, the earliest copy of the Old Testament we had was written in 900 A.D., and it was called the Masoretic Text. So, so there was always a huge spread. It was a problem for both Christians and Jews when it came to our understanding of the Old Testament because like Homer's Iliad, we were in about the same ballpark with them when it came to the Old Testament. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in Qumran in, one, in uh, 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls date back to 150 B.C. all the way up to A.D. 70. And among the Dead Sea Scrolls, we had a complete copy of the book of Isaiah and scraps from almost all other Old Testament books. And all of a sudden, overnight, we hurtled a thousand years when it came to understanding the origin of the Old Testament. And what blew people away more than anything else is that when compared to the Masoretic text of 900 AD, it was almost identical. We'll get to that in a minute, but, but let that sink in a minute. Almost identical. In 900 to 1,000 years, it didn't change. In other words, the copies that we have were extremely reliable. So just the copies alone, the age of the copies, give us strong, give strong credibility uh, to the Bible. Now, second line of evidence under manuscript origin, and this one is going to blow you guys away, as I said earlier, is the number of copies. The number of copies. It, it, what, what language was the New Testament written in? Anybody know? Greek. Greek. Perfect. What language was the Old Testament written in? Hebrew. Good. You guys know, you know your Bible. Uh, we have 5,000 Greek copies dating to within a few hundred years of the time of the New Testament. We have 10,000 Latin copies, and we have 8,000 Slavic and Armenian copies. For a total of about 23,000 copies written within a few hundred years of the New Testament. And, and again, some people say, well, big whip, we have a lot of copies. But I want you again to compare this with other documents of antiquity that nobody tends to doubt. Again, Aristotle's Poetics, we have five copies of that, five copies only. Caesar's Gaelic Wars, we have about nine to ten copies. Homer's Iliad, we have about 650 copies. In fact, Homer's Iliad is second only to the New Testament in which we have 5,000 copies. 5,000 Greek copies compared to 650 of the, the Iliad. And so again, the number of copies is overwhelming when it comes to the New Testament. And the number of copies historically for secular historians has always been an important consideration. Because if these copies, as we'll see in a minute, can agree with one another, then you got confidence. So listen to what Lee Strobel says in his groundbreaking book, Case for Christ. He says the manuscript evidence for the New Testament was overwhelming when juxtaposed juxtaposed against other revered writings of antiquity, works that modern scholars have absolutely no reluctance treating as authentic. So the point is, is that if you're going to accept Aristotle's poetics or Homer's Iliad as at least being written by those men, then you got to accept the New Testament as it is today. Because applying the same evidence that you apply to the New Testament is actually stronger than anything else we have. And then the third line of evidence is agreement among the copies. And I would submit to you that this is the most important, that if there were all these copies written over a span of a few hundred years in multiple languages and they don't agree, then obviously it's going to be hard to see it as authentic. Now, I, I forgot to bring my Greek Bible, but I, I forgot it last night and I didn't have time to go to the office this morning. But I, I have a Greek New Testament that, that I, uh, well, I, I wish I could say I use it all the time, but I used to use all the time, uh, but now I just rely on commentaries. But my Greek New Testament is called the Nestle Alant 27th edition. And it's interesting when you read it because obviously it's all in Greek, but it contains literally thousands of what they call variants. And a variant means that when you look at there's actually four main schools of copies. There are thousands of copies, but it falls into four main schools. When they compare those four main schools, there are indeed quite a few variants, quite a few differences on a very small level. 
And one of the accusations you might hear somebody make against the New Testament is that, and they would be correct when they say that there's literally 10,000 variants in the New Testament, how can you say that's authentic? But slow down. Because you see, the way they count variants is that if one word is misspelled in 2,000 copies, they consider that 2,000 variants. So it's a matter of how they add it up. So again, if one word has one misspelling compared to another, and there's 2,000 of those, then that's 2,000 variants. And you gotta remember, back then when they were copying things, they had no eyeglasses, the scribes would be tired, they'd have some inattentiveness at times, in other words, they were human beings, and of course when you're making copies, you're going to have some small variants when it comes to the copies that you make. And so those do exist in the New Testament. And when I read and study for a message that I'm giving at my church, I look at all the variants. And a variant might be a spelling, it might be use of this word versus that word. I mean, there are some differences among the New Testament. But the variants are always very, very small. And get this, out of all of the variants that exist between the New Testament copies, not one major doctrine is affected. Isn't that interesting? So out of all the different variants, I mean, they're really more about spelling and word choice and grammar, not one doctrine, doctrine not the Trinity, not, not the sovereignty of God, not the sinfulness of man, not salvation, not substitutionary atonement, not eschatology, not one major doctrine is at all affected with the variants. As Norm Geisler says, he says, you have a Bible that is 99 and 44 one hundredths pure. I mean, that's what you have. It's ivory soap when it comes to the Bible. And so again, when you add up the manuscript evidence, and this is just the first line of evidence, the age of copies, the, the, uh, the date, the number of copies and the agreement, and then compare it to any other document of antiquity, the confidence that we have in the Bible is staggering. Now, next major line of evidence that we need to analyze from ancient documents is what they call internal evidence. Internal evidence. And this is important. Internal evidence is simply evidence within the documents themselves that would suggest or deny its authenticity. And so, again, documents that have undergone a lot of change and have been forgeries and all that tend to show themselves through internal evidence that provides some inconsistency. And again, literature has to be our guide here. From what we understand about literature and the internal inconsistencies and consistencies of literature, then obviously that's going to help us with internal evidence. And so again, uh, when it comes to testing the works of Aristotle, what people have done over the years, historians, is that they assume a credibility until contradictions and known factual inaccuracies invalidate it. Do we all understand that? Nobody assumes that a document that says it comes from Aristotle and dates at least to within a thousand years of that time is false. They assume that it's credible kind of like innocent until proven guilty, until contradictions internally or known factual inaccuracies prove it wrong. So applying that to the New Testament and the Bible, uh, there are three main tests that we apply. The first is what they call the eyewitness test. The eyewitness test. In other words, were the writers eyewitnesses of the events or not? And according to historical historians, if a document, uh, is, the guy who's writing it, was an eyewitness of the event, the credibility goes up tremendously. So you guys answer the question. Was Matthew an eyewitness? Yes. Was Mark an eyewitness? No. no. But was his best friend Peter an eyewitness? Yes. Was Luke an eyewitness? No, not necessarily. But he traveled with Paul. He traveled with the apostles. He wrote the book of Acts as an eyewitness. And so he handed down what he saw and heard from them in his gospel. Was John an eyewitness? Yes. So uh, two of the, arguably three, of the writers of the gospels were eyewitnesses. Two to one and a half of them were actually people who got it passed down from others. And so we have a lot of confidence in the gospels. Paul, obviously, was an eyewitness of the things that he was writing. John was an eyewitness of the revelation that he received. Again, a lot of eyewitnesses in New Testament time. And one of the things we also need to understand, however, is the power of oral tradition back then. In other words, if somebody was an eyewitness of something and it was really important 
that they get it right because we didn't have computers back then. There was this thing called oral transmission, you telling another person about it. And it was interesting, from the Jewish tradition, the rules for oral transmission were incredibly strict. I mean, very strict. You've all seen that childhood game where you line up like 10 people in a, in a, in a, in a line and you start with a phrase on one end, and by the time it gets whispered to the other end, it's all messed up. You guys remember that game we used to play with Young Life and things like that? The reality is, that is the exact opposite when it comes to oral transmission in Jesus' time. I mean, some rabbis in Jesus' time had memorized the entire Old Testament. The entire Old Testament. Uh, they, they were rabid about the fact that if you pass something down orally, you had to get it right. And you'd even have multiple people memorizing the same event to make sure that you got it right. In fact, listen to what the Mishnah, which is a Jewish didactic manual from around the time of the first century, listen to what the Mishnah says. It says, a good pupil is like a cistern that loses not a drop. A good pupil is like a cistern that loses not a drop. So the reality is, is that we have a lot of confidence in Jesus' day that when they memorized his parables, memorized his sayings, memorized the historical events, that it was accurate when it was handed down. Eyewitnesses handed down accurately to other people. Second test we provide is the consistency test. Now, some of you are falling asleep already. I know, we got about 29 minutes left, so dial into this one. I'll tell you why. Because this is where your faith will get attacked the most on this test, the consistency test. And you've all heard it. You've heard people say that the Bible is full of errors, that it'll say this in one sense and then this in another sense, and it's contradicting itself, right? The Bible is full of a bunch of self-contradictions. I call those apparent discrepancies. Apparent discrepancy. So when somebody says to me, the Bible contradicts itself, I say, oh, you mean you're talking about those apparent discrepancies. Because the reality is, is that there are some apparent discrepancies in the Bible, and you want to take each one, and maybe we should do a series on this sometime, you want to take each one, one by one, and look at it closely, and ask yourself, does this apparent discrepancy hold water? So, let me give you an example. This is not on the PowerPoint, but you can write this down. If you're taking notes, write down Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, verses Luke chapter 7, verse 3. And I'll read for you the apparent discrepancy. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, and Luke chapter 7, verse 3. It, it's that famous story of the faith of the centurion who summoned Jesus because his servant was sick, and Jesus came and healed his servant. So it says in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 8, when he, Jesus, entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. Okay? A centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, and then they go on to talk about the healing. But Luke, in his telling of what is actually the exact same story, says in Luke chapter 7, verse 3, very, very similar wording, he says, when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his servant. Now, what's the apparent discrepancy here? You guys catch it? Yeah, did he send the elders to have Jesus come or did he go himself and do it? And again, sounds like a small thing, but you and I argue as evangelical Christians that the Bible is the word of God wholly true in everything that it says. And so obviously right there, somebody would say, see, both can't be right, so it's obviously a contradiction. The Bible can't be true. But slow down. Because one of the things you have to understand whenever you're reading any document, whether today or in antiquity, are, are the rules of the culture and how, how the language works and how things are communicated. And most important in this one is the issue of what theologians call the representation factor in that culture. And what they mean by that is that in that culture back then, uh, it would be the same if you were a rich or powerful man, it would be the same as you inviting someone to your house if you did it yourself or if you sent a representative to do it. It would be the same. In other words, it was called a representative culture. So it would be considered the same if the centurion came himself or if the centurion sent representatives. It would be the same thing of the centurion inviting Jesus to his house. It's a representative culture. 
And historians, each even outside the Bible, would understand that. And so the reality is there's not a contradiction there when Mark says that it was the centurion who invited, and when Luke says that he sent elders, they're both correct. Uh, technically, Luke is the most technically correct there because he would have sent the elders. But in sending the elders, it's exactly like he himself was inviting them. And the reality is, is that that's just as, in that culture, that carries just as much water as the other. So this is not just my answer, by the way. Listen to what uh, Craig Bloomberg, who teaches at Denver Seminary, says about this exact same, same issue. I think he's got a good point here. He says, think about it this way. In our world today, we may hear a news report that says the president today announced that. The president today announced. When, in fact, the speech was written by a speechwriter and delivered by the press secretary. And with a little luck, the president might have glanced at it somewhere in between. Yet nobody accuses the broadcaster of being in error, right? So if we say the president announced, but it was actually his press secretary that announced, are both correct? Yes, because you and I also have a representative culture. So the broadcaster would not be in error saying the president announced, even though the president used one of his representatives to announce it. So Bloomberg says this way, in a similar way, in the ancient world, it was perfectly understood and accepted that actions were often attributed to people when, in fact, they occurred through their subordinates or emissaries, in this case, through the elders of the Jewish people. So do you see the importance of taking each apparent discrepancy as they come? I love talking to people about this, especially people that aren't convinced, because it's easy to throw rocks at glass houses it's easy to take pot shots at the Bible and say, well, it's obviously got contradictions, but you got to slow down and look at each one within the historic context of how they were written and ask yourself, is that really a discrepancy or understanding the culture back then, could there be something else going on? And quite frankly, there are quite a few of these scenarios, apparent discrepancies in the Bible. I mean, I've been studying these for years and I have yet to find one personally that I can't find a rational explanation to. Isn't that interesting? My old man and I talk about this all the time, as you can imagine. Every time I go in to visit him, this discrepancy, that discrepancy. And when I slow down, take a look at it, I can always find a reasonable explanation, given that culture, as to why it was recorded that way. So I guess what I'm saying is, 21 years of being a pastor, 30 years of being a Christian, and rather open-minded, I have yet to find anything that would prove to me that the Bible is inconsistent, quite frankly, the opposite. As we'll see in a minute here, this book was written over a 1,500-year period of time. It has 66 different books in it. It incorporates all kinds of genres, different authors, all kinds of perspectives. It broaches just about every major issue in life, and yet it hangs together perfectly and doesn't have one major inconsistency in it. Find me another book like that. You won't. Uh, third test before we move on to external evidence is what they call the cover-up test. And this one's actually kind of subtle but very powerful. One of the things that we look at when we look at documents of antiquity is, is it too perfect? You know what I'm saying? Because is, is if it's too perfect, it's probably fake. It, just, just like today, if you see, see a diamond that might look too perfect from the outside, you have to look at it very, 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 very closely uh, under a microscope to, to understand if it's real or not because sometimes things can look perfect on the outside but it's just un underlying, it's fake. And so when you look at uh, documents from antiquity, they look for its authenticity by asking, does it include anything embarrassing? Does it include anything that might be self-damaging? Does it include anything that would be controversial in nature? And if it doesn't, interestingly, if it doesn't communicate any of those things, or have any of those things, they actually wonder about its authenticity, because that just wouldn't be real life. So think about the Bible <laughs> in this great, or the gospel accounts in, uh, in, in that light. I mean, in the gospel accounts, you find Jesus, you find women first finding the resurrected body. Remember that? How the women were the first ones to find Jesus? I, I got to tell you, that's not a selling point in the first century. It was a much more bigoted culture. It was a culture in which women were seen as third or fourth class citizens. They were not to be, they couldn't even witness in a trial of law, court of law back then. So for the gospel writers to say that the women were the first one to find the empty tomb, see, isn't it empty, was not a strong selling point back then. 
but it's historically reliable. And, and so people tend to accept that. Think of the hard sayings of Jesus. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, I do not commit divorce except for marital infidelity. I mean, the hard sayings of Jesus are by their very nature hard. And again, people wouldn't just write these things because they'd be discredited almost immediately unless they were true. Or how about Jesus' famous statement on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a hard one to get around theologically. And yet Jesus said it on the cross. They recorded him as saying it. And the fact that it is hard to get around theologically, the fact that who would think that the Son of God would say that on the cross, now you and I both understand why, but who, who, who would think that the Son of God would say that actually adds to the historic credibility of the document. And I could go on and on. When you look at the internal evidence of the New Testament, there's lots of things that nobody would want to make up because, quite frankly, they seem to be somewhat self-damaging. Paul the Apostle saying, I'm weak but therefore I'm strong. I'm a fool for Christ, therefore I'm smart. You know, you go, what? I mean, those aren't things that normal people write, but they just might be things that come from the mind of God. And so guys, I gotta tell you, when I look at all the internal evidence, then match it up to the manuscript evidence, I'm getting more and more convinced that the Bible is certainly not a myth. And then one last line of evidence before we wrap all this up by showing you how uh, inspiration is involved in all of this. And it's called external evidence. In other words, are there outside sources that confirm or deny the integrity and historicity of the New Testament? And there's two lines of evidence here. The first one is corroboration by other sources, and the other one is archaeology. Now, again, if the number one claim that people give to the Bible is it's full of a bunch of errors, therefore it can't be true, that the second claim that I hear all the time from people is they say that no other document around the time of Jesus ever talks about Jesus, only the New Testament. So obviously, it's a myth on par with Homer's Odyssey. Uh, Charles Templeton, some of you guys remember him. He was a, one of the founders of Youth for Christ. He was an evangelist back in the 1940s, became a pastor, and then eventually became an agnostic and an atheist and very vocal about saying Christianity is a farce. And at one point in his life when he was very public, he died about 10 years ago, when he was very public and was coming against Christianity, he made this claim. He said, there isn't a single word about Jesus in secular history. Not a word. Not a mention of him by the Romans. Not so much as a reference by Josephus. Now, when you initially hear that, it sounds really compelling, doesn't it? Like, you know, if you're watching a PBS special or one of those goofy MSNBC specials that come around at Christmas and Easter and they're looking at the historical Jesus and they cite something like that, you go, whoa, that sounds ominous. The only problem is, is that it's totally mistaken and totally wrong. I mean, you got to almost wonder if this person was just foolish, ignorant, or had a bent against Christianity in which he didn't mind making inaccurate statements. Because the reality is, guys, is that we have numerous secular, meaning non-friendly, sources right around Jesus' time that confirm his existence. So let me give you a couple examples. Josephus, whom Templeton mentions, is a Jewish historian in the first century. He was born around A.D. 37, and he lived uh, until early second century. And his most famous work is called Antiquities. It's a history of the Jewish people that he wrote in 93 AD. And in this, he mentions James, the brother of Jesus, as well as Jesus directly two different times. And one of the most controversial things that he wrote is so eerily historical about Jesus that historians will actually say, well, Josephus couldn't have written that, but it's right in the middle of his Antiquities. And so you're going, wait a second, you accept all the rest of it, but you don't accept this. Listen to what he wrote at some point, right in the middle of his antiquities. He said, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who wrought surprising feats and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified, those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day, he appeared to them restored to life, for the prophets of God had prophesied these and countless under other marvelous things about him. And the tribe of Christians, so called after him, has still not to this day disappeared." 
Can I think about He mentions Pontius Pilate, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the fact that people called him God, all in one paragraph. And people say there's no secular writing around the time of Jesus that talks about Jesus. In AD 111, Pliny the Younger, who was governor of Bithynia, wrote to the emperor Trajan, again in AD 111, uh, something very similar. He says, uh, I ask them if they are Christians and they admit it. I repeat the question a second time and a third time with a warning of the punishment awaiting them. If they persist, I order them to be led away for execution for whatever the nature of their admission. I am convinced that their stubbornness and unshakable obstinacy ought not to go unpunished. They also declare that the sum total of their guilt or error amounted no more to this, that they met regularly before dawn on a fixed day to chant verses alternately amongst themselves in honor of Christ as if to a God, and also to bind themselves by oath, not for any criminal, pur criminal purpose, but to abstain from theft, robbery, and adultery. So of some plenty younger witnesses that they're Christians very early on who obviously talked about Jesus. Uh, Tacitus, again, I won't bore you, Roman historian from AD 55 to 120, uh, says the exact same thing. He, he says there was this guy named Jesus, he existed, and here's what is said about him. I, I mean, guys, you just can't get over the fact that there's outside corroborating evidence that says the New Testament is true. In fact, Edwin Yamauchi, who for the longest time taught history at Miami University in Southern Ohio, a reputable secular university, a state university in Ohio, once said this. He said, we would know that first, he was asked the question, what would we know about Jesus if the Gospels never existed? If all we had was the outside secular sources, what would we know about Jesus? He says, we would know that first, Jesus was a Jewish teacher. Second, many people believe that he performed healings and exorcisms. Third, some people believed he was the Messiah. Fourth, he was rejected by the Jewish leaders. Fifth, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. Sixth, despite his shameful death, his followers, who believed that he was still alive, spread beyond Palestine so that, they were so that there were multitudes of them in Rome by A.D. 64. And seventh, all kinds of people from cities and countryside, men and women, slave and free, worshipped him as God. So we'd know all that if the Gospels never existed. And people say there's no historical evidence about Jesus? Hogwash. There is. It's all over the place. As if this were not enough, second line of external evidence, and I'm not going to spend any time on this because we're fast out of time, is archaeological findings. Let me just make this statement. Throughout the whole of the 20th century, as Christianity was being attacked by modernism, <laughs> they used to always say, they used to always say, that, that the more we find out about archaeology, the more we're going to disprove Christianity. And over and over again, they'd say, well, the Bible says this, but we have no evidence of it. And you know what the 20th century was one grand experiment in? Is that the more archaeology we found, the more we proved the Bible right. For both Jews and Christians. The stables of Solomon. Um, the Politarchs mentioned in the book of Acts. I mean, I mean, there's so many examples of things that before the beginning of the 20th century, we had no evidence of, but when archaeology exploded in the 19th and 20th century, we started to get much more evidence of. In fact, I love how one expert says, he says, there's never been an archaeological finding, never one, in, in which has disproven or not proven the truthfulness and the historicity of the Bible. <coughs> Uh, a couple of quotes that will give you some confidence here. I think I have them on the screen. Give me a click here. Yeah, Paul Little in his book, Know Why You Believe, says this. He says, one of the strongest paradoxes of our time is the extent to which more and more people are questioning the reliability of Scripture in spite of the fact that there is greater evidence than ever for its trustworthiness. Is that not an enigma? So, so we have more and more people doubting, and yet as Christians we have more and more evidence of it. Uh, Clark Pinnock who was professor of systematic theology at Regent College, said it this way, said there exists no document from the ancient world witnessed by so excellent a set of textual and historical testimonies and offering so superb an array of historical data on which an intelligent decision may be made. An honest person cannot dismiss a source of this kind. Skepticism regarding the historical credentials of Christianity is based upon an irrational bias. And that's really the point, man, isn't it? I, I can talk about this another time, but you know, the reality is we all go into anything with presuppositions. In other words, you went into your marriage with presuppositions. You went into your job with presuppositions. 
Nobody comes into anything with a blank slate. We all go into it thinking something. And when you look really closely at the attacks on Christianity in the last 150 years, there's a lot of presuppositions that people had. Most people that attack Christianity go in it with a presupposition of either a natural worldview, a liberal worldview, uh, maybe a Darwinian evolution worldview. I mean, the reality is, is that presuppositions color our thinking tremendously. And I sometimes wonder if more of the attacks on Christianity are not based on rational inquiry, because they don't seem to be, more than they do presuppositions that people would just hope it's not true, because the ramifications on one's life are significant, right? I mean, if Christianity is true, if God really did come to this earth, die on a cross for your sins, rise from the dead on the third day, and then make a call on your life to his lordship, if all that is true, then that changes our lives. It requires submission. It requires moral evaluation. It requires an examination of our heart and mind and what we're giving our lives to. And the reality is the Bible says that the number one lure of our fallen sinful nature is to do life our way, to go our own way, to live a hedonistic, selfish life. And the reality is God comes along and calls us to repentance. And so I wonder sometimes if the reason that people really don't want to admit Christianity is true has nothing to do with its academic credentials. It has more to do with you don't want to submit to God. I don't want, I don't want to bend the knee to him. Because if I do that, then my life won't be as fun or it won't be mine or whatever people might think. Now, I think sometimes that's what's going on more than not. One last thought. Uh, if the Bible, well, actually, we're going to start, we'll go to that next week. We're out of time. We're not in any hurry with this. So next week, I'm going to finish up uh, this by talking about, and this will be really important, um, how we go from history, the historical credentials of Christianity, to inspiration. And by the way, that's a very important leap. In other words, just because the New Testament, as we've seen today, is historically reliable, does not mean it's the Word of God. Do we all understand that? So I want to talk a little bit next week on why we believe it's the historic Word of God. I'll walk you through that little flow chart I have there, and then we'll move on uh, to our next topic, probably starting midway through next week, all right? But let's pause right now for questions uh, or comments you guys might have. Yeah, over here. Wait for the microphone, please. Doubt the existence of Jesus. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I like how you asked that. Repeat it exactly how you just asked that. Does any reliable historian doubt the existence of Jesus? Does any reliable historian doubt the existence of Jesus? Depending on how you define the word reliable, the question would the answer that would be yes. And I guess I would say, I wouldn't say reliable. I would say, uh, I mean, look, there, there are some historians, albeit it'd be a very much a minority, that would say, I don't think Jesus existed. And they have an answer for everything I just said today. They would say that the New Testament is colored by the thinking of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they inserted that thing into Josephus' antiquities, and yada, yada, yada. They have answered everything. But it'd be so unlikely that all that stuff is true. It'd be like the biggest cover-up in the whole history of the world that most historians would say, no, he existed. I mean, the average historian today would say certainly Jesus existed, and that, but, but they would say they don't believe what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote about him. That, 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 that's why we have to show here today from the evidence that what they wrote was history. There's a whole movement, even within Christianity, that doubts the historicity of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Good. Other questions you guys might have? Over here, up front row. Many times when you're talking to someone that's a non-believer, they'll say something like, you know, well, why believe that or why believe this? And you say, well, it's, you know, it's not me that's saying that. It's God through, right. through the Bible. And then they say, but that's just a book written by right. man. So my question is, what is a short answer <laughs> Because obviously you can't pull out your outline and start going through all this stuff in this kind of discussion to uh, lovingly rebut that. Yeah. I, I mean, again, life is, you know, we live in a soundbite culture in which everybody wants short. Uh, Steve had a question over here, up here. But we, we had, a, you know, there's lots of, a, we live in a soundbite culture. Everybody wants a quick answer to it. There's no quick answer to this. But if I was having a Starbucks with somebody and said, and they said that, and it's happened to me all the time, actually, I'll say, you know what, um, the Bible is a lot more historically reliable and therefore what it says about itself 
carries a lot more weight than what you just suggested. I, I think what you just suggested, with it being a, a myth or whatever it is, it is not as true as you might think. I think the evidence is actually not in your favor. It's more in the favor of the Bible. And now just let that stand. Because you're making a blanket declarative statement in a humble way. Hopefully then that person would say, well, what evidence do you have? And then you either want to give them the link to Marketplace Bible Study, or you want to pull out your outline, or give them Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, or if they're really academic, give them some of Lewis's writings or something like that. But, you know, there's so much writing on this out there. There really is. I mean, it, it, one thing we don't lack from today is Christian publishing. And so there's some great books and resources uh, out there for this. Good. Steve? You just made my point. I, of all the books I've read, Strobel's too, The Case for Christ and The Case for Faith are uh, very compelling books. You might pitch those. Yeah, I do. I, I think I have those actually in the bibliography at one point here. They, they are very compelling. And in the 90s especially, they became, uh, yeah, on page four, I have The Case for Faith listed in references. They, they, they became very, very, very popular. And, and, and not for wrong reasons. I mean, they were just very, very, very well written uh, but there's more heady stuff than what Strobel wrote. So I always, I don't know if you guys do this, I always tailor make my reading suggestions to the person. I mean, you know, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell is the most simple read you can get on this stuff. You, you know, so if it's just somebody who's really watching Oprah, don't tell the women I said that, but watching Oprah and, you know, Dr. Phil and is into that scene and really isn't into what ASU is saying about God, I'll give them that. If it's somebody that, that wants them a little bit more rugged, I'll give them Strobel. But again, you know, I'm going to suggest you go to a, a Greg Kukul site, strstandareason.com, in future weeks here, especially when we get to the problem of evil. And I use guys like Robbie Zacharias and C.S. Lewis and uh, Montgomery and, and, and people like that when I start talking about, you know, the really heady issues because that stuff's really rugged right now. It, it, it's really, really good. In fact, who's the, who's the guy? Um, uh, Craig... Uh, my mind's going blank right now, but my son was reading Dawkins and Hitchens over the summer, the, the God Delusion and the, the other book on atheism, and there's a Christian out of Talbot Seminary that's always wanting to debate Dawkins, and he debated him once, and Dawkins won't even debate him again, and because uh, it was just so good. I mean, there's some really heavy hitters out there right now that are doing, William Lane Craig, that's who it is, William Lane Craig, some guys that are really doing some great stuff. Back here. No? Come on, what is this side of the room's dead. Anybody got some questions over here? <laughs> No. Yeah, right here, Ryan. What, what would you say the role of like just different modern like English translations of the Bible are in this whole argument? When you look at dynamic equivalence and uh, you know uh, all that kind of stuff, like because I know a lot of people that will only read the NASB Bible and they don't even think that you know, <laughs> I mean they they just they don't look at other translations and things like that, and it's like. Uh, I mean, how would you say that kind of factors into this whole argument? I mean, some people, they just it has to be the exact translation and things like that. Okay. That's a good question, Ryan. That's, that's a big issue today. I don't know if you know, guys understand what he's saying, but there's, there's different schools of how we translate the Bible. So, for instance, what, we have what we call a word-for-word -word translation of the Bible, and then what we have what they call a phrase-for-phrase -phrase translation of the Bible. Do you guys see the difference? So a word-for-word -word would take the Greek language that it was written in, and as woodenly as they can, stay to the original structure, the actual wording, you know, and try to obviously translate it to the English language, but keep it as, as true to the actual words as possible. Whereas the NIV is based on what we call phrase-to-phrase -phrase translation, or it's called dynamic equivalence, which simply means they want to have the same thoughts in your mind that the Galatians would have had when they read the letter in their mind. And, and so they do a phrase-for-phrase -phrase translation because they argue that word-for-word -word loses some of its meaning. You're too concerned about staying close to the Greek, and you're less concerned about conveying the meaning, whereas the NIV argues, that's what they argue, whereas the word-for-word -word people would say, no, this is God's word, Every jot and tittle matters. It was written in the way it was written. Let's not mess with it too much. Let's keep it more of a word-for-word -word translation when you translate it to English, French, German, or whatever. And so there's kind of an argument between the two. Now, before I give you my, well, you guys know what I think on this because we use the NASB and the ESV and we don't use the NIV. So obviously, I've tipped my hat there. I tend to think that the word-for-word -word translation is much more accurate and that quite frankly, if you want to understand what they were originally saying, that's the best way to do it. It's harder to read, 
But come on. I mean, it's still English. I mean, it's not the king's English. I mean, it's, it, it, you can still read it. It's just, you know, not as, hey, give me five, Paul. I mean, it's not like that. It's just written more toward, you know, the, uh, the, the, the first century. And, and so I think that's the best way to do it. But let me make a quick comment on that. We have thousands of people at the church I pastor. I can't get the volume of them to read the Bible, period, on a regular basis. So if one of them starts to get excited about the Bible and reads the NIV, am I going to complain? No. My wife reads the NIV. Don't put that on it. You know, but just, I mean, and, and I'm glad my wife has quiet times every day, and I'm glad she loves Jesus, and I'm glad she teaches the kids about Jesus and all of that. So, you know, I, I don't get too bent out of shape about that. I got my opinion. We were declarative at our church. We use the ESV and the NASB. Once in a while, I'll throw in the NIV because I collect Bibles and I read all different translations, but I don't know if that helps or not. But, you know, if you're reading the Bible, I'm glad. Uh, we have time for one more question back here. Ah, see, I knew this side of the room would come alive. You guys, I tell you. Good. Um, when I talk to people or, or friends that do not believe in, in Jesus, they always say, how can you prove that um, Jesus existed? And how can you prove that he indeed did the miracles? How can you prove that he did not exist? And how can you prove that he never performed the miracles? Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, Jorge, that's a good question. Look, I mean, you know, the reality is, what I say to people when they say that to me is, is that you can choose not to believe what the New Testament writers write about Jesus. But if you doubt what they write, you might as well throw out everything that you know about Caesar, about Julius Caesar, about Tacitus, about Homer, about Socrates, about Plato. You might as well dismiss all of Greek and Roman history if you're going to dismiss the New Testament because we have more evidence, as we've seen today, in its historicity than that. And as soon as I say that, people go, well, I don't know if I want to throw all that out. Well, no, you shouldn't because we have great confidence that Plato wrote the Republic and we have great confidence that Socrates said what he said. It's just that if you're going to buy that, then you also got to buy in the New Testament. Now, here's what's cool about that. My dad, for instance, is, is not an evangelical Christian. He's a lawyer. Now, I, I didn't mean it that way, but you guys know what I'm saying. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just meant he's very skeptical and, and, and such. <laughs> and, and my dad, you know, he believes that Paul wrote what he wrote and that Paul wrote it. He believes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote what they wrote and, and that they meant it. In other words, he's got enough academic credibility to say, if I'm going to bind to Socrates, I got to, and my dad would agree with everything I said here today. He would say, I believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, Mark, Luke and John wrote what they wrote and that they truly believe what they wrote about Jesus. It's just that he doesn't buy it. You know, he, he does not believe that, that all that really happened. He doubts their credibility uh, in that. And so that's a whole other issue when we're talking about that. We're going to get to inspiration next week. But that's a different thing than saying Jesus of Nazareth never existed. Again, back to your question, very, very few people would ever say that. But once you admit he existed, then you've got to ask Lewis's famous question, is he the Lord, a liar? or a lunatic, right? Because he's got to be one of the three, because people don't do what he did unless they're one of those. All right, um, we're, we're a couple minutes over, and I, I promise us we get out of time, so good questions. Let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll, we'll dive in next week, and then we're also going to start science and evolution next week. Won't that be fun? Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, just the confirmation that you give us in our faith in your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, I I didn't come to you, as you know, uh, for salvation through apologetics or things like this. It was much more personal and, and very experiential. But Lord, you've given me great confidence over the years uh, in the strength of the faith I have in Jesus through these kind of things. And I pray, God, that that would happen for these men. I pray, God, really two things for these men, that they would take great strength and confidence in the things that we begin studying today over the next two months, and that, Father, that would also make them sharper, as Jorge just said, when it comes to the people in our lives and answering the questions that they have. So, God, we thank you for these truths. We thank you that you've revealed these things to us, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.